Today's video is a follow-up to my previous video where I installed these brand new Cisco Business switches in my home network. As part of that video, I, I thought I would just quickly pop each switch open, take a look inside and talk about it. But as I usually find with these things, I kept rambling on and on and on and realised that while it might be kind of interesting to some people, it would be far too long to fit into that previous video. So instead, I'm releasing a separate dedicated video where we take apart each of these switches and take a look at what's inside. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on each switch because realistically, I'm not, I don't want to be taking off heat sinks. I don't want to be removing parts that risk damaging things because these are very expensive and I'm planning on using them. And I'm not an absolute expert on switch hardware, so if I refer to things using the wrong terminology, please forgive me. But I thought it would be interesting to take a look inside. And in particular, having already taken these apart, I've, I'm filming this intro after finishing the video. There's quite a few little interesting things I've found in this, indicating some level of parts reuse between different Cisco switches. So yeah, it'll be kind of cool. So without any further ado, let's pop these open and see what's inside. And we'll start off with the CBS 350 12XT. So taking a quick look inside the switch, we can see a power supply. We have a power supply over here wired into the mains. DC comes out of that into the main board. It's quite a small power supply because this isn't a PoE switch or anything. Then on the main board, you've got sort of a main processor here. These are presumed to cover the Ethernet Phi interface chips. But yep, fairly simple, not that much inside. You've got this little breakout board over here, which goes to the LEDs and USB port. And we have the two new fans that I put in earlier. The only thing to bear in mind with these fans is that even though they use a sort of standard three pin fan header, the pin out is actually slightly, is actually different from a three pin traditional PC fan. If you look at a standard PC fan header, you can see that we have positive and, ne positive and negative on one side, and then the tachometer is at the far end, whereas on these, you have positive at one end, negative at the other end, and the tachometer is in the middle. So just bear that in mind, if you're swapping a different fan in, on into these switches, you'll need to also rewire the connector. You won't be able to just plug it straight in. It'll physically fit, but it's not the right pin out. Also with these fans, I'm not quite sure what the middle pin is, because on the original Delta fans, I can't really find a data sheet that explains the pin out. And it seems that these fans can either come with a tachometer, which reports the speed, or a locked rotor sensor that reports that the fans stop spinning. And I can't find a data sheet for this exact fan or work at which variant this is to work at what this, this fan actually has. So these new fans are put in, use that yellow wire as a tachometer, but the switch doesn't seem to actually use that. It seems to use some sort of current sensing or something to detect the speed because it'll report the speed even with that wire disconnected. And likewise, that wire disconnected doesn't even report a fault. It can literally work with just two outer wires connected. So not quite sure what that middle pin is, but it does seem to work. But yeah, just make sure the pin out on these is different from whatever other sort of standard PC fan you get. But yeah, that's a quick look at the inside there. It's pretty simple. Nice layout, but yeah, not that much going on in here really. Just lots of big heat sinks, a few switch chips, a couple of fans, and a power supply. Next up, we have the inside of the CBS 350-12NP-4X. And this one's actually got a fair bit more inside and a couple of interesting things I found. So obviously this has a this is a big 375 watt PoE switch. So as you can see, there's a big riser board here that handles all the PoE. Obviously a couple of chips covered by heat sinks to you know what I mean, switch chips and all that kind of stuff. But there's also a few more switch chips in this that aren't covered by heat sinks. We can kind of work out what they are. So first of all, over here, we have a Marvel chip. And this is an 88F6. This seems to be some sort of, like, just general purpose processor controller SOC. So I suspect this runs all the software and handles all the management. So that's kind of that there. This is some sort of flash chip. Here we've got a 4 gigabit Samsung RAM chip. And then over here, we have an interesting chip. So that's a Lattice LCM X02-640HC. And this is some sort of FPGA. So it'd be interesting to know what they're using that for. No idea, but it has some sort of FPGA, FPGA in it. Then obviously, you see all the ports down there. Then over the side here, we have the fans. So we have these two quite thick Delta fans and then this one thinner fan. It's a bit weird to use two different sizes, I suppose probably just so they can fit the board in there. But you have those fans there. Although, interestingly, in this model, the fans are all 4-pin, presumably, PWM fans, whereas in the other switch, they were 3-pin fans being speed controlled by some sort of PWM controller on the motherboard. It's kind of interesting the difference between the two switches, but yep, that's what they've done there. Like the other switch as well, you've got this cable going over to the front board there. But what's different, obviously, is the power supply. Because obviously the other switch isn't PoE, so it doesn't need a big power supply. This one does. So we have this big Delta power supply in here that's powering it. 
But when I took the top off this, I saw something really interesting. If you look at the back, you can see we have the IAC power inlet and also this big white connector. But if you look at the top cover, you'll see that there's no cutout for that additional connector. So that's quite, quite interesting. So I looked up the model number and this power supply is a Delta DPSN-525AP. And it's a 525 watt power supply with about with 7.3 amps on the 53 volt rail. So that's basically what you'd have for about 370 watts of PoE. And now obviously I can't find a definitive list of every power supply or every switch that contains this power supply, but I found some spare parts listings. One mentioned some sort of Netgear switch, but looking at photos of that switch, it also didn't have a cutout on the back for this connector. But I also found spare parts listings for this exact same power supply, mentioning the Cisco Catalyst 2960 switch. And if you look at that, that has a cutout for this on the back for an external power supply. So you can use this for like an external redundant power supply connector where you'd have obviously mains into this and then you have a separate DC power supply and the DC would plug into this as a sort of second power input. So it's kind of interesting that that's here and obviously they've covered it up because I presume the CBS line isn't meant to have external DC power inputs, but it was obviously cheaper for them just to use this existing power supply they already stocked rather than making a custom one for this that doesn't have this port. So it does beg the question what that would do if you connected it. Now I am not condoning plugging it in or recommending plugging it in because I have no idea what would happen and I am not going to try that myself and blow up a 1300 quid switch. But it's interesting to know that that's there behind a bit of metal. So that's kind of fascinating. I'm glad I opened this one up actually because, yeah, it's kind of cool to see the reuse an existing power supply and just blanked off this connector. The other thing to bear in mind when you open this is it's actually kind of tool free to remove this power supply. It kind of just wants to lift up and then sort of come out like that. So just bear in mind when you're opening it, it won't fall out. You don't let it this fall out. Well, actually, also after opening this up now, you can actually see the rating. So yeah, 12 volts DC, 11.5 in, 7.3 amp out. So now I'm wondering, is this an input or an output? Very interesting to see that on the back there. Because obviously those ratings are the exact same as the specs printed on the top. So I don't know if that's maybe an output. Really weird. If anyone knows, please comment, because that'd be really interesting to find out. But yeah, it's kind of cool seeing that. And then to put it back in, kind of want to just slot it in like that, fold it in flat, and then that's in there. So yeah, time to get this back together and get on to the next switches, which probably won't be quite as interesting. Next up, here we are inside the CBS 250. 24T4X, those model numbers are getting quite old. Um, so I've gone through and I've taken a look at what we've got. And it's quite interesting. So unfortunately I can't find any sort of photos inside the Catalyst 1000 series or the CBS 350 series of this same form factor. So it'd be interesting to know if anyone's actually taken one of them apart, how similar this hardware is to those other switches, because those, those are obviously higher end switches. Is the hardware significantly different or, different, or is it just like a software difference? But yep, so here we are inside. So. In the back here you've got this little power supply, there's a part number on it there, it's made by some sort of company, that's a little open frame power supply there, 12 volts, 2.3 amps. Then obviously over here you've got the main switch chip under a heatsink, I'd love to take it off and show you, I'm not going to do that, I don't want to break these. And then along behind the Ethernet ports you've got a bunch of transformers and then these three Marvel chips. And these are have a model number of 8AT1680. And they're eight port transceivers for gigabit ethernet. So you've got three of these to make up the 24 ports. I presume these being Marvel chips would indicate this is also a Marvel switch chip that would kind of go alongside those, but I'm not gonna take it off. But yeah, that's what you have there. Then looking over in this corner here, we see we have a Max 3232E, which is an RS-232 driver, presumably for the serial port. And then up here, we've got another chip here, which is a CY7C64215, which is some sort of like, USB controller. I presume they're using it to maybe drive this USB serial port because it seems to have various UART interfaces along with USB interfaces. So I presume it's driving this USB console port here. So I presume something like that. Other than that, there's a little Atmel microcontroller here, which is a, just an ARM Cortex M0. And then quite interestingly back here is another FPGA. This time it's a Micro Semi Smart Fusion 2. So they do seem to like their FPGAs in these. It's, it's interesting obviously because it isn't a super high-end switch, but they're putting FPGAs in them. It'd be interesting to know what they're using it for. I suspect this is also being used as like the main processor for this because this has like a little ARM type CPU in it as well, I think. It's kind of interesting. Next up in this corner, we've got the switch chip. We've got a couple of companion memory chips. So up here we have a flash chip, which is a Spansion S34ML02G200TF100. I can't quite remember. I think that's about two gigabits or what, 256 megabytes. 
And then down here, we've got a Samsung RAM chip, which is a K4 B4 G16, which is a four gigabit or 512 megabyte RAM chip. So yeah, I've got those there. That's really all there is for the chips in this. Although there's a couple of other interesting observations I've made. First of all, there's this big connector here and I'm not sure what that's for. I suspect it's another sort of redundant power input type thing because you can see it's connected right next to the power supply input anyway. And there's not that many traces going to it. There's just a bunch of like big traces going to multiple pins, which you would do if you wanted to carry high current. So I don't know if this would be designed for like a modular power supply. It's, it's interesting because it clearly looks like they obviously use this board in multiple switches or at least want the ability to do that. So I don't know how much this board is designed for this exact switch or if they do use it in a bunch of switches and in some of those it's got like a hot swap power supply so it's there or you'd have that breaking off to a board that would go to a connector on the back panel and some switches. It's really interesting seeing all these little additional things they've put in. The board doesn't seem to be purpose built for this particular switch. It's also, also interesting to see this has some sort of ba battery in it. The other switches didn't seem to have that, so I don't know why this particular one does. Presumably it's got some sort of real-time clock. It does go to show that potentially this form factor switch is based on a different platform to the other ones. It's kind of interesting. Final thing I've noticed that is actually quite good is obviously this is a fanless switch, but what they've done here for the SFP Plus or the SFP Plus ports is they've got these big sort of not so much heat sinks, more like heat transferers. You can see there's a thermal pad under here, big block of metal. Another, another thermal pad here that makes contact with the top case. So that should be quite good for dissipating heat from SFP Plus modules into the case, which is quite important because obviously in a fanless case, you've not got fans blowing air through. And it does mean that you could potentially use sort of some hot running SFP Plus modules, potentially even SFP Plus to RG45 10 gig modules. Those are known to run really hot. And I wouldn't maybe pack it with those, but the fact that there is good sort of heat sinking on the SFP Plus ports means that you you've got some sort of headroom there for having sort of high power or high heat modules in there. So yeah, let's look inside that switch. So now finally, let's take a look at the last switch. So finally, taking a look inside the 16 port switch, it's basically the same thing. All the sort of chips, the FPGA, the flash, the RAM, all that sort of stuff is basically identical to the 24 port switch. The only thing I've noticed that's interesting in this is that the Ethernet transceivers have heat sinks on them, whereas the other ones didn't. So I don't know if these are maybe a different model. I suspect they might be because this switch doesn't have SFP Plus ports, it's just got SFP ports. So I suspect it's potentially a different switch chip in there for different transceivers, I don't know. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. Although this is also an older switch. It's all the same product line, but this is about a year older in terms of manufacturing date than the other one. I bought it secondhand, obviously. Well, I bought it new in box, but I think it'd been like sitting as like a spare within the company for a while. So it's just been like sitting in the cupboard for years. But yeah, it's kind of interesting to see those heat sinks. And then once again, it's interesting to see that we do have this other sort of card edge connector again. This must be for some sort of additional power supply module they may be used in other switches. It's kind of interesting. But yeah, that's 16 port switch there. Much simpler. So yeah, time to get all these switches put back together. And there we go. That's all the switches now reassembled. So hopefully you found this interesting. I wasn't really planning on this being a dedicated video, but as I usually do with these things, I kind of just kept rambling and then realised this was going to be far too long to fit into the video I was doing previously, so I made it a dedicated video. But I hope you found it interesting seeing what's inside these. It's kind of cool how they've kind of reused power supplies seemingly from other devices, and there's like connectors that aren't used on these, but might be used in other models. So it's interesting how they maybe have some sort of parts reuse there. But yeah, hopefully you found it interesting. And also stand by for the final video in this series, where we look at my new Wi-Fi setup, because that'll be really cool. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.